everybody is certainly safety conscious, and that was always a frustration after I got a Delta. But not everybody, in fact, uh, not a whole lot of people were security conscious. And the, the, maybe the benefit of to security in this business may have uh, been provided by September 11th. Now I think people, and I don't think this is going away, people, all people who fly and who are attendant to the flying process, whether you're uh, busting bags on the ramp loading cargo, whether you're screening passengers, whatever I think for for now on people are going to be almost as equally security conscious as they have been safety conscious I hope and I think one of the things that can happen is that everybody who is in this industry as an employee can be taught to be a security officer for the industry we always had a wonderful relationship with you guys. There was always a person who was assigned to security at Delta from the pilots. And that person, there, I think, uh, that position rather turned over, as I recall, about three times during my nine years at Delta. And we were uh, very much together uh, in terms of how we related. Um, one of the things that um, that helped us with our security was the fact that we had uh, credibility in the cockpit. I was not um, uh, prepared to find out when I first went to Delta that I would be getting calls from the cockpit with with issues that occurred uh, either because of an incident, let's say a bomb threat while, that was received while in flight, or some discussion maybe that was going on about some security issue. And I, and I would call and I would be there, whether it was at home in the middle of the night or where, but we, we were a worldwide airline like you. So I took all this for granted, um, that we had this wonderful uh, integral part of the company. You're there to have a, a prioritized list and in and, and being rated at Delta, they made you uh, list what your priorities were and what you wanted to be rated on. And, and then your boss would modify that as he saw your role. Well, I put as a top priority for my uh, position at Delta to prevent the destruction by sabotage of uh, aircraft um, with uh, uh, passengers in flight. That was my number one priority for, for what I did for Delta Airlines. And if I went back to Delta Airlines or any place else, that would be my number one priority to, to prevent that incident from occurring. The uh, September 11 stuff, I think, pretty much vindicates that as being the number one priority for, for that kind of a position with a passenger carrying airline. Now, what's the difference between you and them? Nothing anymore. But they were, they were targeting. I mean, think about that. What's, what's the potential for you walking out in a major metropolitan area and having a crop duster just fly right down what? Park Avenue? Fly right down Madison Avenue? Fly right down Pennsylvania Avenue? I mean, think, these guys are thinking. We gotta be thinking. We gotta be thinking. I mean, that's ingenious, right? Very simple to go out and learn how to fly a crop duster, take one of those away from its mooring some night when nobody's around and get in and crank it up, load it up with your stuff and just fly over the Potomac River in downtown DC and as the people are arriving for work in the morning, crop dust them with what? I don't know. Nerve gas? I don't know what you do with that. I mean, I really don't. I have no idea. But I thought that was tremendously interesting. I, I use that um, as extreme as it might sound because these guys have been creatively thinking about how they can use aviation to accomplish their objectives uh, for terrorism. And I'd say up to this point, it's terrorism, what, one and us zero? With them on the, uh, what, verge of scoring number two, maybe? I mean, so to, to think creatively now 
is really uh, obligatory. So I don't think that because we have people assigned to this in the FBI or uh, this new uh, transportation security agency that it's their worry and not ours. The heck it's not. It's our worry too and, and it's your worry and you're in the cockpit and so you, you're you even more than me. But I think we need to think creatively and share our thoughts with the people that are responsible now for this. The, the, the uh, group that seems to have kind of just um, gone out of the, the real focus of all of this these days, and hopefully they're hard at work behind the scenes, is the Homeland Security people, Homeland Defense people. Um, big thing there, I think. They, they, they need to hook up big time with this new Aviation Security Administration, Transportation Security Administration. Whatever ideas you have, I would channel them through whatever sources you think, but I would certainly give them to corporate security here at FedEx because that would be the, the one of the, the main places for you to go with any of these kind of things. Now, you say that uh, you're out there and you are following all these leads that uh, I've suggested today and you're scrutinizing people in the airport as you walk through to get your plane or wherever you are in, uh, in some uh, function, or out looking on doing a walk around on your plane or something and you see somebody on the ramp or whatever it is. Um, you, you need to report that someplace rather than sit on it anymore. Rather be a pain in the neck to somebody by reporting these things in, in, a, in abundance and maybe even burdening the airport police with them than saying, ah, the hell with it, I'm not going to buy, I got to get out of here. I, you, know what, uh, better, you know what it is, how we all process this information. Better these days of giving it the benefit of the doubt and reporting it. If you have time, report it to your office of corporate security because that's who's getting paid to do this, uh, this kind of work and has the systems and, and uh, hopefully uh, the uh, relationship with the uh, official community like the FBI, FAA, now the Transportation Security Administration, and so forth, to get that information immediately into the hands of people. And then, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, last thing that you that you need to kind of, I think, rely upon in terms of uh, intelligence gathering, would be the. Um, systems that are out there understanding I think for the first time for aviation security that when they have something that looks like it's critical information they get it into the cockpit as immediately as it's humanly possible to get it in there figuratively or literally into the cockpit I say that because I've had experiences, plenty of them, some really, really egregious, where the information, as it's been regulated to be processed, is not being received in the cockpit on a timely basis or in a manner that's useful or fully useful. That is really wrong. When I got a call on a weekend, Saturday, from the FAA representative that handled Delta Airlines, that we should take all necessary precautions to protect our airline because of a, an external threat, do everything we could to do that. And I was waiting for, you know, why? What should we do? What specifically is the nature of the threat? That was it. There were more generalities, but general answers to specific questions I asked. But take this seriously. Believe us, this is a real legitimate threat. And I said, well, what are we supposed to do? Ground our planes? Oh, no, 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 don't do that. That could come, though. That's the kind of threat it was. But that, that'll have to be decided, you know, by FAA and, and the Secretary of the Transportation and stuff like that. But no, no, keep on flying, but just do everything you possibly can to protect yourself because you have to. And I am not overstating this. So that went on throughout the weekend. 
by the time you had enough of these calls that were not um, any more informative in a specific way than that, you know, you got to the point where you, I was so um, upset and I was very angry with people I liked, uh, but they were following orders. People I dealt with almost every day with FAA and so forth. In fact, there's one lady who still is angry at me with how I was treated her. She took it personally. And I have apologized over and over, and I told her that she should not take something like that personally, but she is their representative. And I was merely reacting to their, her organization. I never said anything personally to her, but I did offend her, and, and I am sorry for that piece of it, but I'm not sorry for the rest of it. So the next day, we are sitting in a meeting in our little office, and we're trying to figure out, I mean, you know, and of course the whole, you know, all my counterparts, you know, with United and American and Northwest and, you know, all, all your guys, you know, FedEx and UPS and everything. We're all trying to do something with this and we don't have much. But it's, I mean, it's, they've made it clear it's the real thing. This isn't just a drill. Somebody walks in to the office and hands me a photocopy of just a regular sheet of paper like this. And on the top, it, well, I can't remember if it was AP or UPI, it was one of the wire services. And in there was the story with details about the bomb factory that was discovered in Manila by the fire department when it caught on fire and the residents of the apartment building called the fire department and reported the fire. When they went in there, they found all this stuff about plans to bomb, as I recall, don't hold me to this, but I'm pretty sure it was 10 wide bodies over the Pacific. And I think four carriers were involved. I, I certainly remember we were one of them. The, the, the other stuff that was found in there was equally revealing about other intentions of these uh, terrorists to attack other similar type targets, but not, not aviation related, but other very, very significant targets. These were the same people that had been, or essentially the same, some of them identical to this people that uh, first attacked the World Trade Center in September uh, in, in 1993. Maybe not September, I forget now. But anyhow, 1993, the first time they bombed it and it didn't uh, succeed in bringing it all the way down. Ramzi Yosef was one of them. He was one of those guys that fled the bomb factory. Can you imagine if you were working on bombs in a bomb factory and it caught on fire, how fast you'd get out of there? They didn't care. I'm sure Bin Laden had, you know, some words with them about leaving all that material behind. Uh, you can see then that why people even then did not really seriously think that anybody would ever, in, in the numbers they did, commit suicidal acts like that. Because our experience with that bunch, same bunch, by the way, same, same program, when their bomb factory caught on fire, they left everything and ran. That's not the, you know, I mean, that's not suicidal to me. Maybe, maybe the difference is they didn't have a cause they were going to die for then or something. I'm not sure. But anyhow, here it was in a, in a wire release, all the information that we had been seeking. We didn't, we didn't even know about a bomb factory. We didn't know about Manila. We didn't know about the, the uh, Far East. We didn't know about anything. We didn't know who the intended, we didn't know anything, we didn't know if it was a bomb or what it was. Now, in this wire release, we had everything we needed. And where did it come from? It came from the news media, not from the intelligence dissemination system of the, of the government of the United States that we are beholding to. So I say to, to the people that are going to be now taking on this new important aviation security role in the Transportation Security Administration. Please, please get that fixed. And I would say one way you can get that fixed, talking about this intelligence aspect of corporate security, is to let the people who are the intelligence gatherers, whomever they may be, decide for themselves about protecting their own sources and methods, but irregardless of that, get the information directly to the cockpit, figuratively and literally.
When I've raised this issue with FAA, who was the previous custodian of all of this type of referral information from our intelligence agencies and law enforcement agencies, they say that these agencies who develop this information want to protect their sources and methods, and they also have to analyze this information because they're, they're intelligence experts, and they have to you know, analyze it and synthesize it and prepare it in a form suitable for dissemination. You know, what's wrong with that picture? And they say, well, we, we, we'll certainly do it quicker if we, you know, see the need is for it to be done quicker. That has not been their track record. Now, that's not in the legislation. There's a section in there. I looked at, uh, Mark was good enough to send me this whole new legislative package that creates this Transportation Security Administration. And there is a big section in there for, you know, uh, obtaining and disseminating information in the community and stuff like that. I still think there has to be a total emphasis on this sort of um, dissemination. Well, uh, the hotline paid off, but unfortunately a lot of people misunderstood its intentions and called it the snitch line and stuff like that. And they were always worried that innocent people were going to be hurt by it. Uh, the people who are uh, going to be operating those hotlines for your company, uh, if you set it up like Delta, will be your legal people probably. Uh, we let them get the original information and then they look at it and then they give it to us unless it's an emergency and we worked up that there's just like I suggested for transportation security there's a there's a two-way dissemination the intended victim gets it at the same time or sooner than the transportation security people well we worked it out with a company that handles hotlines there's a company down in uh, North Atlanta that does this, and I recommend them to a lot of, uh, of the industry, and a lot of the industry did hire them for their own hotlines that created after we had such good success with ours. But in any event, also they had the permission on certain occasions to call me directly, or if in my absence, I don't know what that would be because they always had the pager. Then um, I would find out about it immediately, and we could take immediate action. A website, same thing, kind of, but for people to be able to report stuff that they think is important without being identified, but trust your corporate security people and your legal people to make sure that innocent people are not victimized by somebody just wanting to get even and making false allegations. We can do that. I mean, that's, that's, there's, there, there are many ways to do that. And, and so far as I know, I've never seen anybody victimized like that. Polygraphs have a real role to play, especially in my view, to, in today's aviation security makeup. If these adversaries of ours have been as creative as they have been and as vicious as they have been, and they seem to have scouted out things pretty well, don't you think it's reasonable to assume that they have moles in our industry? I mean, you know, and you don't have to have you don't have to have it at the pilot level. Hell, that'd be almost a waste. You know, these guys when they wanted to take flying lessons and only wanted to know how to do it in flight, that's a clue. Well, why do you only want to know about? It? I mean, you know, they'll some pilot will let you have your hands on the controls or something while they're in flight, while he sits there and makes sure you don't you know do anything wrong. You don't need to know just well. They don't need to go to pilot levels to get done what, you know, they can, and I would say to, to address your unique needs with freight, by getting themselves in on the ground level as freight handlers or what have you in some way, they can penetrate you successfully to the extent that they can about do what they wanted to do with one of your flights and one of your shipments. You, you don't need any more evidence of how creative they are. But wouldn't you, if you look at how creative they've been and how much they like airplanes, look how many of their initiatives have involved airplanes and attempts at airplanes. And I still believe, and I believe with all my heart, that all four of them didn't take off that day.
I mean, they're, I'm sorry, all four of them took off. I don't believe those were the only ones to take off that day. I believe out there there was at least one or two more that didn't take off for other reasons, and we really got to find those. And I hope they're looking at that. But airplanes they like, they like the dramatic statement that it makes. Uh, I don't know that they're done with airplanes. I'm sure that the next f shoe that falls with them may, may not involve aviation. But I wouldn't be surprised if it did because it just makes this big dramatic statement from the sky, this huge thing. Moles in our industry are a very viable possibility and one of the best ways I know of is polygraphing them. They've worked up a system, and it's very sophisticated how you do backgrounds, but let me tell you from doing audits at Delta out of corporate security, which is, a, which is a, still another way corporate security can help you by doing audits of your stations and all the employees that work for you at these stations. There are ways of beating your background investigations without even trying. Have you ever thought of, like, when somebody gives you an application to be a baggage, or not a baggage handler, or a ground crew member or a, a passenger screener, what kind of jobs they've had before they came to that position? They've had jobs with high turnover, and that accounts for the high turn, part of the high turnover in, in amongst them. 100 to 150 percent turnover among guards and passenger screeners is the norm. So now you go to call the supervisor, you go down the list of employ previous employments and you try calling them. Well, the supervisor they had is not even there. Not only aren't they not remembered by anybody else because everybody else has turned over since they left that particular McDonald's stand or what have you, but the supervisor, they had, that supervisor's not there. So if doing a background on these people, verifying what they gave you in, a, in an application for security purposes is not the, not the complete answer. And gaps of employment, that's, that was a very creative approach, I thought, and, and, and really focusing on, on doing a lot of work for those that showed gaps of employment of, of six months or more, unexplained gaps. Um, that's good, but I mean, I'll tell you one thing, I think you could do an awful lot of good for the foreseeable future in this industry if you started polygraphing, and, and for a specific limited purposes, it doesn't leave that that arena, you would have strict guidelines about what you're going to polygraph employees. It's not lifestyle, it's not all the other taboos. It is for the specific purpose of, are you here to sabotage aircraft? That's it. You're not going to ask them about anything else. And I honestly believe we would do good if we set up that kind of system through the Transportation Security Administration. I think a, a, a easier target, and I say that because um, when one of the new heads of uh, civil aviation security came aboard, a, a man that I knew from when I was in the FBI, General Steele from the Marine Corps, retired general, he had a couple of security directors and myself, I think there were two others and myself, one other for sure anyhow, for dinner one night in Washington, D.C., I flew up from Atlanta. And uh, he was wanting to get briefed in this new role, which uh, you know was commendable that he wanted this kind of briefing. And uh, after we ordered, to make a point, I said, General, I said, now I can get up from this table and I will leave here, sabotage or plant a sabotage act with an airliner, and I will come back here by the time our meal is served. And I'll, and I'll bet you that nobody stops me and I bet you it'll be successful and he you know gave the expected reaction of disbelief and I said no I said it and this this has been changed now I will go over and I will put a package in Delta Dash's package system and I'll uh, designate it for delivery tomorrow in Los Angeles and I said that'll be a bomb and it'll go and it'll blow up and he turned to the other guy, I, I, I want to say there was two other corporate security directors, I just remember one. But anyhow, asked him, is that true? And the guy said, yes, that's true. The way that it presently is, that cargo system is the most vulnerable part of the whole thing. I, don't, I know that a lot of things have been improved in terms of security for cargo, but I still think we're most vulnerable there. <clears throat> The answer to the first question about uh, as a 
corporate security representative for Delta Airlines, were we or myself involved in monitoring union activity in any way? And the answer is absolutely no. Did you hear me? No. There was never anything <laughs> that never, ever, ever was expected or asked or, or done. Uh, we are not, uh, you know, that is not a, that is not a mission of ours. Uh, every now and then you come across stuff that related to maybe a, a, a union event or a management event or, I mean, it, when I talk about being horizontal and vertical in a company, it all comes to us. I mean, it, no matter what it is, and, and we uh, had no mission against uh, unions or for unions or anything of the sort. Uh, what to do about if you have evidence that that is happening here, I leave that up to you. I would say that you probably have uh, legal uh, recourse there with, with your people who represent you legally, and that's where I would direct you with that. Well, yes, I can understand if, that, if you have evidence of that. If you have suspicions of that and then no evidence, why, uh, there's not uh, any, any direction you can really take. But, you know, there's always... Uh, experts that can sweep your phone lines and can sweep your rooms and and so forth and you if you have concerns that that might be occurring you can have that done you know I mean you hire somebody outside to come in and do that and if it's there they'll find it I mean the, the technology is such now that it's pretty difficult to get away with doing that um, you know we used to we used to be uh, uh, doing a lot of that under court court authorized uh, S uh, surveillance under federal legislation when I was in the FBI and uh, that technology to detect that and thwart it exists and I would hire it then if you suspect that and if they find something they're obligated uh, to tell you of course and turn it over to law enforcement so I hope that's not the case I would I would dearly dearly hope there's none of that occurring I really would that's um, that would be uh, not only regrettable but that would be uh, illegal Is it your opinion that, and, and this kind of goes to what Mark said, where we draw in law enforcement to identify a problem, a simultaneous notification of corporate, where a captain walking around an airplane, we see something we don't like. Contact corporate security simultaneously, the airport authority, and, and make that a public request of our crews. If they see a problem, communicate to corporate security first, and legal law enforcement second. On the premise there where you find it. So they, the reason you want to tell uh, the authorities right away is so they can do something about it. If it's an individual, they can catch the individual before they get out of there or what have you. That's what law enforcement exists for. They'll be the first responder as they were at the Trade Center. That's why so many of them died, because they're the first responder to that sort of stuff. Mr. Otter, I'd yes, like sir. to uh, thank you for coming and speaking with us. You're welcome. Yeah, sure.